Coming up, we begin a three-part series on the Quinault Indian Nation as they face climate change. Plus, we love the potato. Let's go to Peru, to the Montero Valley, to learn about this important indigenous vegetable. Join us for those interviews plus headlines on the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. Support for the ICT Newscast with Alia Chavez comes from the Arizona PBS studios in Phoenix at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. Thank you for joining us. I am Shirley Snavy, in for Aaliyah Chavez. We start today's newscast in California, where tribal and government officials advocate for missing and murdered indigenous people. ICT's Paris Weiss has the story. While May 5th is National Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Awareness Day, events and demonstrations for MMIP occur all year round across Turtle Island. In California, tribal leaders, assembly members, senators, and activists gathered at the state capitol to express their commitments to ending violence on tribal lands and bringing victims home. The state's first Native American assembly member, James Ramos, who implemented the state's feather alert, shared remarks on this epidemic. This week will commemorate those we have lost to the MMIP crisis and the loved ones, um, the victims left behind. Sadly, California ranks fifth in the nation in the number of unresolved cases and cases being investigated. As of now, two California tribes have declared states of emergency due to the numbers of missing persons from their reservations. This includes the Yurok tribe and the Coyote Valley Band of Pomo Indians. Assemblymember Ramos also recently presented Bill ACR 133 to redesignate May as Missing and Murdered Indigenous Peoples Awareness Month in the state of California. Yesterday, at a hearing, we heard testimony that tore at our hearts as witnesses shared their personal stories in raw emotion. The trauma in history and why this issue touches just about every one of us in this chamber and in the state of California. The gathering ended with a vigil at the state capitol lit up in red with hundreds in attendance and remarks from victims and their families. Paris Wise, ICT News. A historic agreement has been reached to help tribes exert their river rights. The Upper Basin Tribes, which is made up of six Native communities from Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah, have signed an agreement with the Upper Colorado River Commission. Under the new agreement, tribal representatives will meet with the commission every two months to discuss water rights and Colorado River issues. The chairman of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe explained in a statement that the tribes have a 25% claim on the basin's water rights. In North Dakota, two Native American lawmakers are voicing their frustrations after what they say was yet another example of racist behavior in their state. Video posted online from late April shows non-Native students imitating powwow dances at the Flasher High School prom, a scene that caused a group of Native students to walk out. It comes after an incident at the girls' basketball game where a cheer coach and a parent allegedly witnessed students using derogatory language but did nothing to stop it. Representatives Lisa Finley DeVille and Jamie Davis have since asked the U.S. Department of Education to step in. You know, I'm an advocate for zero tolerance. And what that means is, you know, in no way, shape or form should the, this type of language, this type of actions be, be used in any format, in any circumstance, under any context. It's just not acceptable. In Oklahoma, tribal, state, and federal authorities are dealing with the aftermath of devastating tornadoes. At the end of April, 35 twisters struck Oklahoma, 12 of which destroyed the Chickasaw Nation town of Sulphur. 
75 homes were damaged, vehicles toppled, and several businesses demolished. Of the 35,000 Sulphur residents, four were found dead, including an infant and a woman found in the rubble of a downtown bar. Governor Chickasaw Governor Bill Anatubby says his nation's emergency management is still assessing the damage. State Governor Kevin Stitt has since declared a state of emergency in 12 counties after speaking to President Joe Biden. Four Aboriginal spears were stolen over 250 years ago have been repatriated to Australia. The artifacts were brought to England by Captain James Hook. It's all that remains of some 40 spears that Cook took in 1770 at the time of first contact with indigenous people of Kame or Botany Bay. A return ceremony was held at the end of April at Cambridge University after a formal repatriation request was agreed upon and became a step towards reconciliation of Britain and Australia's shared history. The spears will be displayed at a new visitor center built at Colonel Kime. We go now to Washington State, where ICT has launched a five-year project looking at the impact of climate change in tribal communities. ICT's Mark Trahant is here with us with the report from the Quinault Nation. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Leah. It's really curious because you're covering a slow-moving story, one that unfolds over time, and the pace of climate change is something that's just different. And one way we want to illustrate that is to do it over time. And as part of that on this journey, we're exploring the shifts affecting the Quinault Nation. I'm here in Tahola on the Quinault Indian Nation. Today the sea is calm, but the sea is also relentless. It keeps rising. The community of Tahola faces floods every year. And in 2021, people were evacuated. Plus there are king tides highest tide of the year that pushes water back several streets. So more than 20 years ago, this community began talking about relocation. So the water was coming in from the river and just coming directly into the village. And it was just kind of coming in through the driveway and then coming in through the rocks. It just, it probably filled up both of these streets here within two and a half, three and a half hours maybe. And then where we were standing now, we probably got up to, you know, a little over 12 inches. What makes the Quinault story so powerful is that it's a window into our future. The idea that, like it or not, a changing climate will determine how we live, where we will live, what we will eat, and how much it's going to cost. Quinault is extraordinary in so many ways. The geography ranges from glaciers to ocean. On the coast here, climate changes now. Every year, there are threats from storm surges and king tides. And on the Quinault Nation, that has meant a thoughtful, long-term approach to a solution that preserves community and the tribe's values. Tribes have, have really been at the leading edge of, of people in this country feeling the impacts of climate change. And of course, tribes have been warning about this for a long time. Indigenous values and teachings are finally getting centered and put in that limelight because uh, that paradigm shift the rest of society has to do. Indigenous and Native people are already doing that. And we know this, the floods from storm surges will increase over time. There you go. This is the beginning. I think high tides here in uh, about two more hours. So you can see the ocean here kind of starting to wave up. But as you look down, you can actually see there's a ton of driftwood sitting up here. And it just keeps... Like, keep so for several years now, the Quinault Indian Nation has been in the process of planning a move of the village of Tahola from the mouth of the Quinault River to higher ground. This process started more than 20 years ago, showing the firsthand complexity of how climate change impacts one community. We're at this place in, in time where the world is on a trajectory that can't go any further. It, it's not sustainable. And so we're starting to witness everything collapse around us. We're seeing ecosystems collapse. We're seeing political systems collapse. And as everything around us collapses, those things that we stand on to be true, to be timeless, we are rising. So 
So we were trying to come up with a strategy to where we could uh, get elders to be the very first part of the relocation, and, and uh, rightfully it should be the ones that are most affected. So uh, we recently just did win an award. There are immediate concerns. The next flood is only a storm away, and the homes that survived the last ones are sometimes infected with black mold and other health concerns. The new village is about a half mile away on higher ground. The Quinault Nation has built most of the infrastructure, streets, housing plats, sewage. So what you can see here is the development of our first phase. But you know, as far as building the houses, you know, that's still a, that's still a whole nother phase to go. So I, I know we were talking about. And reflecting the nation's priorities, the Generations House, the first building is a center for elders and children. This was our most modern effort to, to relocate our most vital citizens. There are still many questions to be answered. What happens to an elder who has worked their whole life and paid off their mortgage, but because they live in a flood zone, they have to start all over again? How does that work? And who pays for all of this? The Quinault Nation has not figured out yet where more than $450 million will come from. We recently just did win an award for, I think, $1.9 million from HUD, and that was to construct six senior units. So that's, that's going to be our first go. And here's the thing. The Quinault Nation is further along in this sort of planning than nearly every community on the planet. When we drove up the coast to get here, we passed through low elevation towns and even cities and saw the scale of the problem. And it's clear that neither the region nor the country are penciling out what has to be done and what that will cost. Mark, relocation is a word with history. Tell us what it means here. Aaliyah, think about our ancestors and what they went through with forced relocation, whether it was marches or other traumatic events. It was based on land and policy. This time it's different. Climate change is forcing us all to think about relocation. And, and I should mention here that we plan on doing this story for the long haul, showing it how it unfolds over time rather than just one time and be gone. Mark, we're really looking forward to that coverage. Thank you so much for being here today. You can see part two of Mark's eye-opening journey through the Quinault Nation tomorrow as he uncovers the heavy price tag that comes with tackling climate change head on. The lowly potato is not really so lowly. It's an important food crop all over the world. But for the indigenous people of Peru, it's a way of life. The McKnight Foundation has this story from Montero Bay about how the global food systems are linked through this crop of the Andes. Let's watch. Fundación McKnight viene apoyando proyectos de agroecología en Ecuador, Perú y Bolivia desde hace casi 20 años. Para nosotros, para el equipo regional andino, es muy importante que no solamente la junta directiva, sino el staff con el que trabajamos continuamente, conozca de cerca, de manera directa, la realidad del Perú, de los países andinos y la realidad de la gente con la que trabajamos. Oftentimes it's been that global sort of imposes itself upon local realities. We did see a little bit of that here, but you also see the power of the local knowledge, local networks, local leaders, local experiences, moving into influencing in global spaces. And that's the kind of thing we do and we want to do even better so that we can make a difference in this time where we know we need to shift how we grow food on this planet, who grows it, and how the economies grow around it as well. El Valle del Mantaro es un lugar muy especial y aquí es donde se siembra bastante cantidad de papas. Y ustedes saben que el Perú es reconocido por ser centro de origen de la papa y también por, justamente por esa razón instituciones como el Grupo de Napay y la Fundación Magnay apoyan a, a estas experiencias para seguir eh, conservando la biodiversidad. En el caso de Perú, 
Uh, the estimate is around 3,000 different uh, cultivars. Uh, the most important actor for the conservation of these varieties is, of course, the farmer. So we are here together with Grupo Yanapai, which is an NGO working in the Mantaro Valley. We are also here together with Aguapan, which is a farmer organization uh, representing the custodian farmers, also with people from CERNAM, the nature protection area from the government of Peru, uh, the municipality of Quilcas, and uh, also the International Potato Center. La papa is the base of alimentation of the Peruanos and is the third cultivar of the most important a nivel mundial, proporcionando calories to the humanity. Entonces es bastante relevante lo que sucede en el Valle del Mantaro, no solamente para el Perú, sino para la humanidad en su conjunto. We have to lift up these amazing leaders, the issues and the challenges that they're facing, but more importantly, lift up the solutions and aspirations that they um, present to us that we believe will not only support them and their families, their regions and communities, but also will support the world as we try to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions across the globe. We think about community practice as an important moment for learning exchange, networking with others, and collective action. We saw the relationships, the trust of all kinds of people that wouldn't normally know each other, be comfortable with each other, challenge each other, uh, learn from each other. We just have to have a deeper appreciation for what they contribute and who they are, what their dreams and aspirations are, if we're gonna really solve these problems together and to be good partners to them. And I think that's really important for us at McKnight is that we wanna be the best partners possible to the courageous characters across the globe. Languages are among our most valued resources. Ensuring that they are preserved and taught is important in Indigenous communities and here at ICT. Today, we're continuing our language break segments, which features native speakers from across Turtle Island, sharing their beautiful and bold words and phrases. This week, we bring you the Hawaiian language from Kuma Kaui Peralto and music from Kalani Pae. <laughs> Ka ulelo no keola, i ka ulelo no kamake. I ka ulelo no keola, i ka ulelo no kamake. Our words have the power to give life and death. I ka ulelo no keola, i ka ulelo no kamake. Our words have power. E na moku puni o Hawaii nei e alama. Across the country, we hear about news of tribes getting their land back. Whether an outright purchase or a donation, the movement is gaining traction. Our project at the University of Kansas is putting it on the map. An idea of MacArthur Fellow Sarah Deer, a fellow professor, helped her create a website to quantify the land back movement. Um, the origins of it are probably 10 to 12 years ago. Um, I had found a story about a Pennsylvania farmer who discovered that he was on stolen Delaware land and decided um, on his own accord to find a way to return that land to the Delaware tribe. Um, and uh, they, you know, the Delaware tribe's now in Oklahoma. So Pennsylvania has been a long time ago. And I was just touched by the story, you know, that when we talk about land back, it's not a metaphor, it's actual land back. And as a private landowner, I found it very interesting that he would do that. And so I wondered if there were other private landowners that had 
some interest in donating or returning, I should say, the land to its rightful owners. And I came up with a list over time. Then I met Ward at the University of Kansas, shared the list with him, and he made a map. In terms of the map, it's a collection of uh, publicly available news links that uh, started with the list that Sarah shared. And then I researched um, to find news stories that were already um, in circulation about instances of return of land um, and used uh, an ArcGIS uh, web-based software uh, that's publicly available to create the map and to provide links to the news stories and also to the um, tribe or nation or um, group page of the of the folks who had um, received the land. Yeah, we're still just now getting the word out. Okay. Um, and we hope that, you know, with some publicity that we can get some feedback uh, from private landowners who have donated land or tribal nations themselves. And again, it's just trying to help people think about land back as a literal return of stolen land. Uh, and so we anticipate this to be a dynamic project um, that will be ongoing and re regularly updated with new information that we come into, um, that we that we learn about. We've had students um, involved uh, at different points of time at different degrees. Um, this project um, is one that, as, as Sarah mentioned, she shared the idea with me and I've been working on it, but it's not an externally funded project or um, a grant, it's um, our time as, as academics. And there've been some students who've uh, to date donated their time. I do anticipate that now that word is getting out and even just from our own um, accumulation of, of news stories, we may have to change the platform that we're on a little bit because uh, the the number of instances of land return or things that are close enough to land return to be included on the map uh, is going beyond the, the software's capacity to, to host them. Um, and so that will probably be a project that actually involves students a little more in trying to get them opportunities that can help them build their knowledge, but also build their careers. You know, I think there are probably ways to use this project in, in a context that I haven't even thought of yet. Um, it's primarily right now to educate, to give people a sense of what's happening, uh, perhaps inspire other landowners um, who live on stolen land to be inspired by that and consider themselves uh, where their land is and who it originally belonged to. I also think that it's um, you know providing data for the land back movement as a whole to say again, that this is not just an aspiration or a metaphor, but it can actually happen. And then the third audience I think would be um, you know, other scholars and academics um, who may be writing about land back and can use this map to find specific data that's relevant to their own writing project. So it kind of depends on who's looking at it in terms of how the tool can be used. Looking through the news or, or podcast or whatnot, then I think about the connections between, say, the, the Quapaw land in Oklahoma, where there were lead and zinc mines and, and the connections then when you think about that lead and zinc went into so many of the bullets that have been used in wars um, around the wars of colonial conquest in the 20th century and um, just the connections between how land has been used and misused and how it's being um, returned and, and what condition it's in because um, that's that's certainly one of the questions here is is there capacity to to uh, manage the land well? Um, is the capacity remotely close to where the land is, right? Because we have um, here in Kansas, lots of uh, lineages with different tribes that this is not their ancestral homeland. So it goes to a very basic question of who is the land returned to? Um, so again, this hopefully it, it helps the, the website and its evolution will help people think through different dimensions, legal, moral, ethical, relational 
um, around these projects. One of the links we have, because in addition to the map, if you continue to scroll down and are patient, <laughs> you'll get a list of links. And some of those links in, in, inform um, the user as to the legal implications of the transfer of land and the complexity of the return because of questions of taxes and um, inheritance and trust land and all of those things, which we already know are super complicated in Indian country without land back. And so, you know, we would, you know, encourage anyone who is thinking about this kind of project to consult uh, an Indian law attorney early on in the process. To find the map, search KU Land Back. Right now, the priority is tracking private land owners and corporations returning land. State and federal land returns are not reflected on the map. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. For all the latest, visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom, stay safe, my relatives. This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.